So welcome everyone. My name is Omolara Obanashola. I'm a senior lecturer at University for the Arts London um, and I'm a member of the Caribbean Fashion Design Research Network. So this is the third session in a series of presentations and for those of you who uh, haven't joined the previous sessions I will just give you a bit of background. So Widaya is a series of talks which have been organised in collaboration with the Design History Society and the Caribbean Fashion and Design Research Network. Established in October 22 by a group of researchers whose uh, research interests really intersect um, in a variety of ways across the Caribbean region. The Research Design Network was established with the aim of amplify, amplifying the voices and the histories of the Caribbean, a region which remains underrepresented in histories of design. The Caribbean here is defined in its broadest sense. So it includes the islands in the Caribbean Sea or those countries that share its coastline. The final session in this series of three is looking at heritage, diaspora and identity. It brings together researchers and practitioners who are investigating notions of heritage, identity, diaspora through an examination of fashion, textiles, beauty and style. The speakers he will be sharing tonight touch on a range of subjects such as the symbiosis of history telling, making, archiving to the Windrush generation, um, and questions around where do West, West Indian people fit into reconstructive and dominated, dominant narratives of their own culture, and if their work can contribute to decolonized fashion and textiles narratives. So uh, we will look at each um, speaker in turn. And if you do have any questions or points, uh, we'd ask you to save them till the end, but you are welcome to add them into the chat as you go along, and then I'll moderate them and pick up any questions. Because they are illegally leaking all over the place, and he repeated that line of attack in some sound that we have from over the weekend. Take a listen. That wasn't me, was it? I think it was. Can I introduce our first? Yeah. Yeah, lovely. So our first presenter in this series is Jade Lindo. Jade is a design historian and recent graduate of the MARCA VNA History of Design. With a BA in Fashion from the University of the Creative Arts in Epsom, a Gillian Naylor Prize winner, She's intrigued by issues of social and cultural histories surrounding identity, hair, beauty, and colonial impacts within the Caribbean diaspora. Hello all, um, I present to you today, Caribbean Hughes, Nadinara Deluxe, Carnival Queens, and the performance of Beauty. This dissertation project takes its title from the Global and Transgenerational Cosmetic Cream, Nadinola Deluxe, which was originally created by the National Toilet Company, founded in 1899 in Paris, Tennessee, USA. Nadinola was officially filed as a trademark, trademark by Strickland and Co. on the 21st of August, 1931, held by them until 1967, when the license was registered by E.W. Abrahams and Sons of Kingston, Jamaica, a family-run cosmetics business specializing in hair and skincare. E.W. Abrahams and Sons focused on formulating a toning cream that became known as Jamaican Nadanola Deluxe due to its distinctive list of ingredients, including 3% um, ammoniated mercury, enabling its utilization as a skin bleaching cream. This forms the springboard of my dissertation. Next slide, please. It is imperative to understand how the image of blackness in these societies such as Jamaica and Britain during my time period resulted in the desire to compete and be seen be, to be seen as beautiful by using a cream to lighten the skin shade or an agent that would reveal a glow that was desirable in a national cultural context. 
This dissertation examined the cultural ecologies that supported the use of bleaching creams in the 20th century, Jamaican culture. This overarching question will explain the various generational ideals of beauty dictated and inherited by British colonialism, but also how these ideals have been reintegrated and internalized as throwaway comments or loving guidance. Starting with 1955, significant for various reasons, such as the 10 type one people beauty competition, creating a new section targeting dark skinned women in Jamaica. The Carnival Queens of London being broadcasted on BBC also. In 1961, Flamingo and the West Indian Gazette were created by Claudia Jones. It is important to note that although Nadanola had been on sale since 1899, during the period of 1959 to 1965, bleaching creams and agents were advertised extensively in Ebony, USA, and Flamingo, UK magazines, which were created specifically for Afro-Caribbean individuals. In order to focus on the journey of the Caribbean diaspora and specifically how these individuals' voyages con contributed to the overarching image of self for them, this thesis is primarily informed by ephemeral and visual material taken from the Andrew Sulky Archive of the British Library, the Black Cultural Archives, the Bodleian Library in Oxford University, the National Library of Jamaica and the National Museum of Jamaica. These items of ephemera such as Flamingo, and Black Beauty and Hair magazine, the Star newspaper, also your neighbours from the West Indies, gave an insight into the environment that members of the Caribbean diaspora were confronted by, and in turn, how they perceived them were perceived by members of their own culture and their host community. I use these visual sources as methods of reconstructing the social context of the Caribbean and its diaspora that has culminated in the persistent use of bleaching creams and AIDS. Next slide, please. Next slide. Can you see the slide? So, yes, thank you. So chapter one, Dark Beauty, explores the legacy of British colonial standards of beauty in Jamaica, showcased in the image of 10 type one people beauty contest, which started in 1955, which provides the context of pageants and their role in the assimilation of dark skinned women to the realm of beautification and the explicit use of the media, such as the Star newspaper and Spotlight magazine as tools to showcase these images of beauty. Here from left to right, you can see an actual advertisement from the Star newspaper for an ebony type girl um, for the Miss Jamaica 1959. And that was taken from the British Library. And then you have an earlier advertisement, um, which was taken from a private collection, which I luckily found of this idea of Jamaican beauty queen. And this was a white woman at the time and her name was Judith Verity. And she was a Kingston born Jamaican lady who was given you know, the prize of Miss Jamaica. And then in the right hand corner um, is some actual clippings from the film of a 1959 copy of a newspaper of the actual woman that um, they actually took part in the competition for their parish, St Thomas, and they were considered the Ebony Girls. So very different to the kind of visual representation that is shown in the actual star newspaper. Next slide, please. So during this process, I conducted interviews with my parents about their own um, migration journeys from Jamaica to England, which started in the late 1980s. It was vital to hear their voices and how pivotal that process was to their own identity and later my own through intergenerational informed notions of beauty and race, but also their ability to kind of share their inner workings of how they viewed their own identity as well. So interviewing my mother, Gloria, shown in this image here on the right, revealed some undertones of languages like 
introduced through the theory of performance described in Judith Butler's excitable speech as a key component of the desire to compete for desirability in this paradigm of beauty. Butler suggested that words can wound and linguistics can operate as a form of violence, whilst also arguing that speech can be excitable as it becomes a fluid, it becomes fluid due to its ability to affect the speaker, the image the words portray, and the surrounding power structures. The internal logic of Gloria's speech, stating that she just wanted to make her face brighter, illustrates the influence of this language that goes further than advertising in a magazine. Especially as Gloria considered herself as someone who did not need to bleach because of her good complexion. The complexion referred to as good is seen in this image and recognized as light skinned and does not need to be changed, which was often seen as a key component in the use of Nadanola Deluxe in their various advertisements. Chapter two, Shade Shifters, which this interview finds itself focused on the advertising of bleaching agents and products to Caribbean women, the manner in which they were used and the understanding of the creams when they were promoted as a device to contend with the endless notions of beauty fixated on the image of lightness ex ex explicitly shown in Nadalona advertisement taken from Ebony Magazine. Next slide, please. Um, which is shown here on the left is an original Nadanola advertisement in an Ebony magazine. And then you see the front cover of Flamingo from 1962 in February. And then there are some more clippings that kind of zoom into the whole idea of what was considered beautiful. So for even people moving to Britain, there was still this undertone that they would kind of, I guess, try to achieve beauty in the sense of what it means to be beautiful from their own upbringing or their own identity in the Caribbean. And that was highlighted in the below image taken from September 1961 in Flamengo magazine, where it talks extensively about how someone with darker skin needed to make various kind of compensations for how they looked and they needed to focus on toning their skin. So essentially proving my point. Next slide, please. And then the final and third chapter, Performance in Masquerade, is concerned with the migration of Caribbean people to England, how they were met with racial segregation, how they tried to seek new sources of identity, focusing on the introduction of the Notting Hill Carnival Queens, which was published in the West Indian Gaz Gazette exclusively, and how the use of creams would be imperative in the performance and transformation of self. So this is really important, um, especially the bits that I've pulled out. So here you can see um, In Order Going to Britain, which was written in 1960. But what I found really interesting was Your Neighbour from the West Indies, which was actually published in 1955. And in this, it talks about like what the host community should expect, how they might be, how their language might differ. And it pays close attention to their skin, how that's gonna be different, how you're gonna view them differently. And it's funny to see also on the other side that those that were already in Britain at, in 1960 were trying to establish themselves in various ways. And then they came up and they wrote go into Britain to kind of lay out the land. So again, there's always this making of identity and remaking of yourself all the time flowing through my dissertation, um, which leads to the Carnival Queens, the first lineup, which um, very interesting. It kind of differs from the very first lineup that you see of the 10 types um, one beauty competition or one people competition where all these women here even though it's a black and white image you can tell they're a lot darker they have their natural curls but they're still modeling in that initial kind of look of what it means to be beautiful with their high heels on and they're wearing swimsuits everything that links back to that kind of colonial Eurocentric view of beauty Next slide. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. And I think you really spoke to a topic which is still really kind of pertinent and really prevalent. And I think what um, I found particularly interesting is that it's such a kind of wide and still quite a prevalent practice in terms of beaching, but also one that isn't really spoken about, although it's kind of very visible. Um, so if anybody has any questions, just as a, as a reminder, you are welcome to put them into the chat and we'll pick them up at the end when all the speakers have um, presented. But I've I've got a few questions, so please do think of some questions for our speakers, um, whether it's kind of with, in relation to the topic or kind of their process of researching. But thank you so much, Jade. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker um, and introduce her now, but also just to let you know, after this presentation, we will take a short break in between. So Zana Hart is an art director and writer from Trinidad and Tobago. So, uh, the attempted murder of Angela Waters. Uh, Thank you. Uh, from Trinidad and Tobago. The uniqueness of her Caribbean heritage and studies in the UK and Germany inform her sensibilities in the North European design and global perspectives of culture. At present, she is studying her MA in the history of design at the Royal College of Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and is uncovering the stories behind voyage culture and hopes to tell the story of Caribbean migrants to the UK. So Zana, over to you. Thank you. Firstly, before I begin, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for having me, uh, especially including me amongst these really incredible women researchers. Um, Jade, that was so incredible. I was really caught on to everything that you were saying about the impressions of beauty and how that changes particularly or is perceived particularly within the West Indian community. Um, and I'm really looking forward to all the other talks. Um, so as Umalara said, my name is Zana. I am from Trinidad and Tobago. My uh, research is slightly different uh, compared to Jade's in terms of I'm looking a lot more at these sort of ways of documenting history that was done particularly by the Windrush and West Indian migrants that have moved here to London. So I will share my screen now. I just want to make sure everyone can be everyone can see my screen. Um, so yeah, I will start with the title of my research. It's called Not All Trunks Will Float. And I extracted that from one of my favorite poets, Olive Senior. She's a Jamaican woman, uh, author and writer. And this was like an intentional play on words that alludes to the sort of very fickle nature of tangible and intangible matters of history within the Windrush's historical evidence. Um, I found it quite fascinating that there's this very particular and massive forgetting or loss of the historical archive within the Windrush. And it seems to happen over and over as time goes by. And I think it's a, a problem that we as researchers don't really know how to tackle because the very word Windrush um, as a result is constantly revolutionizing in meaning. Um, and it's going beyond its sort of symbolic relationship to the quintessential vessel because it's now representing an entire society of people within London. And so I was really interested in the sort of idea that this particular migration of people were responsible in the sort of telling, creating, designing and archiving of their own history. Uh, and I delved into that a bit more. So, the next one. Yes. So I started with trying to sort of understand what it meant to have a Windrush culture. And in reading the sort of theory by Stuart Hall and understanding culture in terms of media and these sort of different spectrums of what it means to 
create a medium. I looked at all these different sort of like subcultures that existed within the Windrush uh, while they migrated to London in 1948. And there were a lot of different sort of subcultures that existed. Uh, but because this dissertation was for my master's, I limited it to just these. Um, mainly because I think there was a lot of weight within these particular sort of outputs. Um, I was very interested in the fact that there's this sort of tangibility happening in the written word and the sort of academic text, text by the first sort of migration by the Windrush in 1948 through their student unions. And then adjacent to that, there was this sort of need for oral history to happen by these institutions that were popping up between the 70s uh, to today. And I think that that is a really interesting sort of telling as to what the archives is becoming and how that sort of formed during that time. And so I particularly from a writing standpoint looked at the West Indian Students Union, which was formed in 1945 and it unfortunately closed in the 1970s. And this was sort of adjacent to the influx of West Indian people migrating to London. As we all know, they, the migration starts in 1948. Um, and I think that this was particularly because there were a lot of different investments happening in the system of education for West Indians. A lot of people were moving uh, to Britain in pursuit of master's programs, PhDs, and it was quite an elitist um, group of people because they were able to afford to migrate at that time. Um, and I think that because of that, there was this sort of like high academia cohort of people that were that were coming together and they were being these sort of pioneers for um, the onset of the independence of Caribbean islands. And so there's this sort of like energetic and radical charge coming with them um, in the sense of wanting to write, rewrite, and have this sort of onset of post-colonialism happening. And so what I thought was really, really beautiful um, during my research was that uh, Pearl O'Connor, Pearl Connor, sorry, she was a member of the West Indian Students Union. And the way that she described this sort of mass of, of migration of, of these academics, where she said these were big wigs knocking on the doors of colonialism. And I thought that was quite striking because for me, um, I think that when you find out that the these are like really sort of top-notch, like high academic representatives of the Caribbean that have, in my time, then become the nation's first prime ministers uh, during the independence. I think it's quite significant looking back at how during the sort of migration, there was sort of like a need to establish themselves within London so that they can then bring it back to the Caribbean. So through their sort of like establishing themselves, they, they put together a fund to get themselves a center in West London. And with that, they were sort of disseminating like different sorts of information, um, predominantly academic information through these newsletters, which I thought were quite fascinating. And within these newsletters, there were a lot of discussions about Black power, Black history. This was obviously during 1969. And so there's a lot of sort of like radical discussion happening at this time. There's a lot of um, global sort of uprising in terms of Black representation. And so I thought it was quite interesting the way that this was a method of collective storytelling. And I think that it's almost in line with the way to sort of establish a cultural identity, there's also a need to have that sort of communal act of telling your history together. Um, and I think that's probably what sat at the core of my dissertation, because I found that this was a, a specific type of history telling that was 
based on these findings, very West Indian. Um, and I will go on to this a lot later, but I was finding these sort of features very particularly in the oral histories as well. So moving forward from this, uh, there's also this magazine that was published by the West Indian Student Union called Bumbo. And this was created by the union exclusively, but it was also being published and disseminated through the New Beacon Books, which was the first Black publication in London, also run by a Caribbean migrant named John LaRose. And I think that that sort of like general combination of creation, design, publication, dissemination, um, all you know, sort of resounding around this sort of like radical energy. I think it was really significant because there's something really interesting in the way that these sort of communal efforts and this collective knowledge production, what it means for a Caribbean reader, what it means for me now as a Caribbean researcher and how that resonates with the way that I read and interpret and decode these messages. And I found that as a researcher, obviously being from the Caribbean and reading this sort of text that's one, very academic, two, very sort of using these particular idioms and languages that are quite like Caribbean rooted. Um, that in and of itself has a lot of different, a uh, lot of different like weighted messages within it because I think that then when you're thinking about the sort of need to write your own story, what sort of limitations are present as a Caribbean person? And then I think about me as a Caribbean researcher, I'm able to navigate the sort of ephemerality of a text. Uh, but I'm thinking about the average Windrush person that migrated there and they probably did not have the exposure to this sort of like academic setting. And so there are a lot of different limitations, I would say, but also possibilities that sit within this sort of like history making and then how that's being archived will be affected thereafter. And in contrast, I the way that I constructed my dissertation was I put this side by side with the oral histories that I interrogated at the British Library. And I wanted to start off by thinking about the context of Calypso and how that has historically come from Kaiso, which is very um, West African influenced. And Calypso was always seen as a response to the socio-political occurrences and states of the Caribbean within its time. And I thought about the way that orality and the way that we speak and the way that we articulate thought is quite political in and of itself in its nature. And there's something about going to the British Library by yourself, <laughs> sitting in a very dark room, putting on like, you know, their headphones and, and you have your own limitations within that space, um, needing to, you know, be present and be very much listening and attentive to those particular recordings in and of itself is quite a, a particular experience. And I think that I wanted to point out the fact that me being a Caribbean person also in this sense, I'm able to engage with the voice very differently in that there's a sort of deeper connection that happens when you hear a Caribbean person speak within a very British environment. Um, and that brought me a lot to this really amazing researcher, Patricia de Rocha, and she speaks a lot about these sort of post-colonial texts and outputs. Um, I thought this quote was quite poignant where she says, these fragmented and experimental story-based, sorry, um, sorry, I won't reread it, but I thought that this was really, um, important in the context of understanding and sort of uniting these representational and these sort of sources that were interrupting and de de destroying this sort of like system that was created for them in the terms of like 
creating history and making history, um, but also understanding that these were the resources that were at hand and these were the learnings that uh, academics as well as the whole system around recording their own memory um, was played. And so I think that it was important for me to understand those sort of paradigms. Uh, one of the particular interviews that really struck me was by Linton Questy Johnson. And he says, and I quote, I was ecstatic. My grandmother took me to an Obia woman to protect me ahead of my journey. She didn't want people in the community to wish bad things on me. And this was his memory of Jamaica before he had left uh, aboard the Windrush. <clears throat> and I think that my stance as a researcher was more that I was less interested in the actual validity of the memory and I was more interested in the sort of corporality or the sort of bodiliness that was within the sort of recorded memory because when when Kwesi said this he his voice sort of cracked a bit there's this sort of like telling of a of a grandmother's care for a grandson and I think that that is what's important and that's the sort of voice behind this need to tell a history or need to record a history is what's more important for me as a researcher and I think that that's what makes this also quite unique because there's this this connection that happens with post-colonial historical outputs um and I reacted to this while listening. And I, I had like a sort of journal where I was writing my own responses um, and sort of recording my experience, uh, interrogating these voices when I went to listen and sort of like decode these messages. And I included, this is probably, yeah, this is one of my journal extracts. It said, in response to Kwesi's quote, this moment surges through me. I feel the warmth of a grandmother's intentions to shield, knowing that she may never see her grandson again. So what happens then is that I had this journal full of reflections. There were these incredible memories being retold to me from the British Library's audio system. And I didn't at the time know how to sort of relay what this meant and the relationship of these sort of um, elements happening at once. And after having sort of looked through the written content of the West Indian Student Union, I sort of navigated or understood how the sort of power dynamics within that writing occurred. Um, in terms of having access to public publications, having access to being able to purchase those publications, et cetera. But there was something about oral history that was a bit harder to decode in those sort of power dynamics. And what I had eventually come to was this sort of joining of axes that I had created where there was this very striking sort of difference between hearing someone sort of speak in a stream of consciousness versus having something like very much media produced. Um, and there were a lot of these instances happening within the archive at the British Library. And so I was looking at the sort of relationships and the power dynamics between the broadcaster's influence and that sort of branding that happens within the oral history being told and the intonation versus the intonation by the interviewee and their sort of emotions being embedded within the sort of recording. Um, if this was something that, you know, felt sort of really heavily constructed by Western influence or if, if this was like, in fact, a moment for the Caribbean migrant to really reflect on their sort of memory. And I think as a result, again, there were also these sort of limitations existing within oral histories as they were in the writings. And I found that quite interesting because I think naturally we would not compare and contrast writing versus the voice. But I think that 
altogether, they will always have these sort of constraints slash possibilities within different outputs because ultimately these were these were constructed by a post-colonial society. <clears throat> and during that time, I had done, I had conducted a, quite a few interviews with representatives from different archives. And we had discussed this sort of like retaliation of needing oral history, of needing these sort of historical outputs to be archived. Um, because, you know, for, for multiple reasons, Hannah Ishmael from the Black Cultural Archives mentioned that it was because a lot of Caribbean people were eventually moving back to the Caribbean or they were passing away. And so there was this absolute need to have all of these uh, conducted. And I think that what's quite interesting about that is that there then adds this fragility um, in conserving these sort of outputs. And then that sort of like third cog in the wheel of how people are able to access these becomes affected because if there's already <clears throat> if there's already this need for higher production companies or just any sort of institution to get involved in the sort of like general historical output of these uh, medias and cultures, then that then affects how everyday society has attack, has access to them. Oops, sorry. And I just wanted to end on one last note. Um, ultimately, what I had configured in this overall dissertation was that the outputs were not conducive to documentary legacy of the West as colonial record creating and keeping have presented archival challenges for formerly colonized countries and territories. So essentially what I'm saying is that I think these institutions and just general archival practice needs to come up with a, a sort of different strategy at how to preserve and allocate the ways of creating and preserving these sort of historical outputs because they were already rooted in a post-colonial context. Um, I think that finding that strategy will be interesting. I haven't gotten to that answer just yet, but I think that there's a lot of room for exploring that and trying to figure out how do we combat this sort of archive that was created um, by a sort of very Euro Western society. And then how do we introduce something that's a bit more Windrush oriented and something that can help bring that forward and make it more continuous. And yes, thank you so much. And I'm curious to hear any questions or comments, but thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to all the other speakers ahead. Thank you so much. Um... That was such a great, great presentation. It's given me sort of so much kind of food for thought, as I'm sure with everybody else as well. I, I feel personally it's such a kind of valuable um, piece of research and, and also for the kind of reasons that you mentioned, also quite timely. And I, it definitely um, resonates with me in terms of things I've looked at. And I thought what was really interesting as well, and, and, and I'm sure this will come up later in, in discussions, but where you're talking to like embodied experiences and I think it's um you know it, it, again kind of re researching a similar area is it's so fruitful and so rich and then that those ideas around how we kind of document that or archive that or if we don't how we kind of put value to those in, embodied experiences that really sort of resonate and give a sense of that time in a way that particularly with the Rindrush um isn't always there in the way that it's represented. So uh, I'm going to stop talking now. Um, but I definitely got lots of questions um, and, and could talk about that for, for a really long time. So I don't know if now is a good time to take a break. Um, perhaps other people want to put some comments in the, the chat or kind of hold on to their questions to the end. But I think if we take a break now and return at six. So our next speaker is Dioxia Blue Ellis Crook, a singer-songwriter, researcher, 
textile designer and artist from West London. She has a BA in fashion and business from the University of Brighton and uses her creative practice to interrogate notions of identity and belonging. Her current exhibition at the Gunnersbury Park Museum embarks on an emotional exploration of her connection with her Jamaican grandmother, who is battling with dementia and Parkinson's disease. Through the work, she reflects on her grandmother's journey, aged 21, from Savannah Lamar, Jamaica to Paddington, London, towards the end of the Windrush period. Interweaving her grandmother's poignant handwritten reflections and fragmented memories as she attempts to piece together the jigsaw puzzle of her dual British and Caribbean heritage. Thank you. Uh, can you see me? Yes, well, I can. I can see okay. you. <laughs> Um, okay, so, um, if we go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, so my project, Jigsaw Heritage, started off as my degree project, um, at the University of Brighton, and I basically started with an investigation of my heritage which started with my grandmother um, who as mentioned suffers with Parkinson's disease and dementia and so it's very it's very difficult to kind of understand our family history because uh, she's all of her memories are quite jumbled and she has quite a few blocks in discussing her childhood in Jamaica because um, she did come over to England quite early uh, towards the end of the Windrush period. But I was really kind of excited by the challenge of decoding all of her memories and um, I began asking her questions and kind of forming the questions in different ways, kind of showing her pictures and and songs and asking about proverbs and kind of using stimulus to jog her memory, which came, which resulted in quite fun answers from her. Um, if we go to the next slide. So that's my grandmother. Um, when she was around in her 20s and then recently I think last year that was taken so I started visiting her um, and every time I would visit her she would be writing something um, she's always writing and kind of drawing and scribbling and I think that's her main outlet today because um, previously she'd always be cooking and cleaning always using her hands but now she's in a care home and her main outlet is these drawings. Um, and I thought, found that really fascinating. And from a print's perspective, so as a screen printer, um, I realized just the way that she was writing, I think um, from her arthritis as well um, and her handwriting kind of remnants of her handwriting from before she was um, sick, it's created these really beautiful designs. And I love the idea of um, kind of decoding these messages and these memories that she has. Um, if we go to the next slide. So as you can see in on the left at the top, those are some examples of her handwriting in the prints. And I called the project Jigsaw Heritage because it reflects me piecing together all the different parts of heritage and also represents my grandmother's mind, which is quite kind of colorful and jumbled. And I think she's also trying to piece together her memories with 
with um, her illnesses and trying to piece together her life at the same time as me, her granddaughter trying to piece together um, my heritage. So I, I found that quite poignant, the idea of the jigsaw puzzle and her words being um, inside those puzzle pieces, which you can see on the left and behind. Um, and this was from my exhibition last year at Pitsanger Gallery, um, which was up for Black History Month. On the right, uh, you can see my prints which um, contain animals, and those are based on Jamaican proverbs. So looking at um, Patois sayings and, and kind of folklore and realizing how many animals, animal imagery were in all of those proverbs and sayings and how fun and playful they were. So those were um, printed and then embroidered, hand embroidered, and um I think those came out quite fun uh the next slide so one of the <laughs> um so one of the um kind of my main inspirations of the project was inspired was madras cloth and I call well, these, these are digitally printed. Um, my, my kind of recoded madras cloth is what I called it. And um, so these were hand drawn and then put onto Photoshop and edited digitally. So kind of designed digitally and put onto silk for very lightweight and transparent, which for me, I was very interested in those kind of very transparent fine fabrics because it represents how um, kind of tenuous my grandmother's memories are and how just kind of the film of memory is something I was quite inspired by. Um, if we go to the next slide. So I then looked at Madras cloth uh, paired with the idea of the English rose, which represents my dual British and Jamaican heritage being mixed race, and also my grandmother and the Windrush generation coming from Jamaica to England, and kind of thought about how to represent those two worlds. So that's my grandmother in the back, in the background in the 70s. Um, the next slide. Uh, so on the left is a picture from my exhibition, which is on now at Gunnersbury Museum. And uh, you can see on the right here, the, the, these textiles are three meters long. So they go down quite far past this um, banister. But uh, you can see kind of the tops of them. But the reason I was so interested in Madras cloth uh, was because I saw it as this freedom fabric. It has a very complicated history linked to British colonization and slavery. It was originally created in India in Madras, which was which was the region named by the British. And it was kind of woven very fine cotton with vegetable dyes and influenced by tartan as well. And it was then used as a fabric to kind of, it was sold to slave owners and used to barter for slaves and worn by um, Caribbean women and, and enslaved and, well, enslaved uh, women, especially, um, which obviously is a very sad history but it was then kind of used as a way of um liberation so it was worn I was very interested in the history of Jamaican Higgler women so the market women and the way in which they donned themselves in in these 
um, bandanas. And I was really interested in what Carol Tallick spoke about um, when she described the unofficial world of the working class women and how they styled themselves in this freedom fashion dress. So the market was this very female dominated space and it was one of the only ways that um, pre-emancipation and post-emancipation in the 19th century that women could um, create a living for themselves. So it was kind of on their terms, um, the way that they would earn money and they really took pride in their in the way they styled themselves and having this unofficial uniform with the bandanas, um, which was made from Madras cloth. So that um, that really cements it as this kind of journey of liberation. And Madras cloth today is still used as a lot of the national dress costumes in different islands across the Caribbean and is a fabric you think of particularly for Jamaica. So on the left, looking back at um, my textile piece, I've put my grandmother's portrait inside um, my recoded madras cloth. Um, and you can't see very well, but the first, this piece is called Before Mother, I Was Me. And at the top, it's her when she was young and kind of making that brave journey to the UK just for curiosity for a better life. Um, and that's that's a story um, that really inspires me as a young woman. Um, and then below it's cut off, but you can see you can see slightly that it's um, my grandmother as an uh, as a young mother, so with one of her children. Uh, she's a mother of five children and many grandchildren now. Um, and I was really throughout this whole project and investigation, I really got to know my grandmother as not just my grandmother, not just a mother, but just as this really courageous and interesting young woman and um, so that this is one of my favorite pieces that I've created because she's I've kind of put her in this um freedom fabric and um also a fabric that represents a journey um and a, a tumultuous journey but a journey of kind of perseverance and true strength um so yeah that's that's the story behind that piece um next slide uh this diagram just shows as well how madras cloth in bandanas was worn in these different styles to communicate different things and um, to communicate kind of status and also as a form of liberation and self-styling as a resistance against the laws that meant they had to wear um headscarves to to hide their hair but then they they styled their headbands so that was something I found quite incredible and uh, the next slide uh this is some more pictures of my uh, Jigsaw Heritage opening at Gunnersbury. Um, so you can see some of the prints, some of my prints behind um, one of the performers on the event and a dark photograph of the display. Um, but this is kind of introducing how I also use music as a form of storytelling. Um, on the next slide, I think, got something oh um so I'll come back to the idea of music as storytelling but something else um which I was really interested in during my dissertation and during the uh, during my design process was the portraits that Caribbean migrants would take and 
the portrait, they would kind of go to a photo studio, professional studio, and dress themselves um, and kind of have these photographs taken, which they could send back home. And I was really fascinated by this and also um, reading what Stuart Hall wrote about these postcards saying how they constructed themselves um, in kind of different settings and use their, their uniform dress as a form of self-telling. So the, the um, wallpaper that was used here was chosen, I think it was chosen quite randomly, but also to represent the Caribbean in some way but it wasn't a natural picture of the Caribbean, um, which I found quite interesting, just the way, just the whole kind of setting of the portrait. Um, but I think it really draws attention to their dress, and that was the thing that they had agency over. So all of that inspired um, something I'd done at my exhibition opening, um, which was having a portrait section against my own textile backdrop which you can see is the recoded madras print um with the english roses printed on top so that was a screen print which was very very big um about three meters long again um and it had multiple layers of kind of lines and different um different layers of flowers which kind of represent the two worlds and again that journey of migration not just the madras fabric but of course the windrush migrants coming to the uk and i had the guests um guests were able to take their portraits against um the fabric so i thought that was kind of my nod to that history of taking portraits and having agency over your story and how you're presented. Uh, the next slide. So going back to what I was saying about um, music as storytelling, also as part of uh, Jigsaw Heritage as a project and investigation, I naturally wrote a song about um about my grand my great grandmother so in all of the research on my grandmother Odeline I looked to her mother and she was called Dorothy Brown and there's a photograph of her in in my grandmother's living room which I always would look at and I would see this woman who seemed very poised and elegant in the way she was dressed and just in her just in her demeanor and they only ever had one photograph to go by but it really sparked um a lot of questions I started asking people in my family if they knew anything about her I, um because she died before I was born and stayed in Jamaica and um, the response was always that she was very quiet and um, very sweet and just quite unassuming, um, which I, I found kind of hit very close to home because I think some people would describe me that way. Um, but I, I know, of course, that there's obviously so much more behind that. Uh, behind the surface. So that inspired this song slash poem I wrote about her, which is also, which plays, this song plays in the background as part of the exhibition, um, which is up for six months. If you want to see it, I'll read it out. So. Yeah, I, yeah. I, can, yeah. Play, I can play the song if you like. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hold on, let me stop sharing. Sounded like a good idea, but now I can't find it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I have it on my desktop. Sue Brown, right? Just while we wait, can I just ask the question that's in the chat from Jacqueline Bishop? Yeah. It's just a, it's a technical question for you. So how did you get the images on the textiles? Your work and story, by the way, is gorgeous. Thank you. Um, so I, I think the ones you're referring to, those were done on Photoshop. So um, a lot of my work starts with drawing. So drawing a lot of designs by hand and then scanning them onto the computer and working on them digitally. Um, but with the photographs, I basically just played around with merging the photographs onto my already designed madras cloth. Um, so that was just a lot of playing around on Photoshop. And then it was sent off to be digitally printed. And then um, I sometimes print on top of that through a silk screen as well and add more layers. I hope right. that makes sense. You ready for the song? Yeah. So this is Dorothy Brown, the song. She She was great, never forced She gave birth to her again. In her mind, she would cry. Bound to not be much desire, she might dream of you and me, and what it might be to be free. Men's dollar and baby run. Dollar and baby run. Run. Um, if you go back to the slide, I'll just read out the lyrics quickly. Um, so it goes, she was quiet, a bit somber, still melodic. She was grace, never forced it, but she gave birth to a rocket. In her mind, she would glide, bow to not be pushed aside. She might dream of you and me and what it could be to be free. Miss Dorothy Brown, Dorothy Brown. She's deliberate, every word, yes, she meant it. And her clothes so pristine, she could dress like a queen. In her heart was a song or a hymn of freedom. Maybe more than a mother, more than a lover, something inside her more than survivor. Miss Dorothy Brown, Dorothy Brown. Um, yeah, so that is the song I wrote, and it's not out anywhere yet, but I can try and find a link to send um, to responding to that comment. Um, I think on my Instagram, I have a video of, of me performing it at the exhibition. Um, so I think, is that the last slide? Yeah, looks like yeah. it. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Wow, I feel like uh, it's one of those moments if we were all in a room together, it would just go silent. I mean, that 
it was a really beautiful piece of work. And I know there was a, a comment that says the same thing. Um, in the chat, there was a link to an Instagram. So can I just ask if that is the link to the video? Perhaps I, just... I just put it in for Jai. Uh, yeah, I found it on her Instagram. So that's the link to the video of her singing. Okay. And so, hi Jai, <laughs> it's Dominia. Hi, hi Dominia, thank you. Thanks so, for putting it in there, Dominia. Dominia is also a wonderful artist, by the way. There's so many of you. There's so many of you. That was uh, that was really amazing. I, that was such a beautiful piece of work, and um, I will just really quickly say before we move on that I I feel that it's such a kind of personal and, and fragile story and piece of work and that there were sort of elements where you were speaking to like it being sort of quite fragmented both like the the process and, and and piecing together that story but I felt that it was a really like layered piece of work both through like a material and text and image and, and coding it's just really beautiful and I know that that's no kind of easy feat to add so many elements to a piece of work and for it to come together and, and still kind of have that sort of, that sort of fr fragility and, and kind of personal nature. That was amazing. Um, wow, so I will go on uh, to our next presentation and I will introduce uh, our presenter. So last, but by no means least, Leonie Edmead is a textile designer born in the UK with a Caribbean background, who explores ways to visualize her cultural lineage and influences. Her main aim in her practice is to create and showcase space for lesser known cultures to be appreciated by experimenting with color, pattern and materials. And her portfolio is a continually growing body of work of innovative textiles supporting her ongoing research into the relationships between textiles, dress and identity. Currently, her research focuses on West Indian Sea Island cotton, highlighting its deep and disturbing history, whilst reimagining its functionality within textiles and fashion discourses. So Leone is here, but we're gonna play a recorded presentation, which I'm gonna start now. Hello everyone, my name is Leonie Edmead and welcome to my presentation on heritage, diaspora and identity. My research explores how West Indian sea island cotton can be used to decolonize the Caribbean fashion discourse. Today's presentation will give an overview of the narrative of this cotton and its links to Caribbean dressing styles as I question how my practice can contribute to decolonizing these Caribbean fashion spaces. My research response project titled Yarns to Farms is an ongoing body of work that focuses on these areas of research. In beginning my research, I came across a quote from the Fashion and Postcolonial Critique Journal stating, textiles used in fashion production can relate to the dramatic experience of flight and migration is indicated by the German expression, der Faden ist gerissen, the thread is broken, which refers to the interruption of an event. This resonates with my work as I quite literally work with threads of yarns, weaving these physically and metaphorically alongside my research into identity and self. Migration is also a part of my heritage and an important story which I weave into my work. So, if you are unfamiliar with this plant, West Indian Sea Island cotton is one of the rarest, if not the rarest cotton in the world. A huge commodity during the transatlantic slave trade, it was grown on many islands across the West Indies and production continues to this day, mainly in Barbados and Jamaica. Nowadays, the cotton is used prodigiously through, throughout luxury shirting. Many high-end British and Italian brands supported by the West Indian Sea Island Cotton Association use 100% of this cotton in selected products. This is extremely rare and therefore these products have become very exclusive. As much as the trade is still ongoing, there is very little evidence of Caribbean people's contribution to the modern day trade aside from the farming of the crop. It is rare to find textile designers in the Caribbean or of Caribbean descent who use this material in their work. During the 1970s, around 100 Montserratian young women were taught how to weave this cotton as part of a government initiative to keep the production going on the island of Montserrat. Prior to this, all Mansa Russian Sea Island cotton was exported to England. 
Unfortunately, due to the catastrophic volcanic eruptions in the 1990s, many women left the island for England, leaving one woman named Doris, the owner of Love's Cotton Shop in Salem, Montserrat. She continued weaving and selling her cotton products after the eruption, and the shop opened in 1995, but there is little evidence that the company is running today. It's really encouraging to know, however, that there was, and still could be, some Caribbean production of West Indian Sea Island cotton. It must be acknowledged that migration has played a huge role in the displacement of creativity from the Caribbean to the wider world. Like many of the Montserratian women, many creatives left the Caribbean, particularly since the Windrush generation, including my own grandfather, who was a tailor. Some of these creatives have been widely acknowledged, such as Trinidadian textile designer Althea McNeish, whilst others, other talents have slipped under the radar and were never brought to light for others to appreciate. However, what has followed with the mass migration of Caribbean people to the UK and other parts of the world is the undeniable influence of Caribbean culture across many creative spaces. In relation to fashion, this is very evident through the evolution of dressing styles from the dapper looks of the Windrush generation to the stylish influences growing throughout the 70s and 80s to modern day designers such as Nicholas Daly and Grace, Grace Wells Bonner, who pay homage to their Caribbean roots. It's clear that the Caribbean diaspora are very committed to expressing their creative identity. So how does this link to my research and what does decolonizing these fashion spaces look like? To me, it's important for these spaces to be unapologetic in their influences without conforming to Western fashion standards per se. It's about producing work that is heavily inspired by roots and culture, and that is not othered because it's not to a Western standard of fashion. We know there are designers who are currently working in this way through their fashion brands and collections or collaborations. As a textile designer, however, my aim is to continue this work by exploring the foundations of fashion being the textiles, and how this can inherently change how we as designers can further decolonize these fashion spaces. In short, take Caribbean textiles and Caribbean fashion styles and fuse them together. This leads to my response project titled Yarns to Grants. I've put together a short clip documenting my textile process and I hope you enjoy. As I'm developing my style as a designer, there is one thing that's consistent about the way in which I work. It's very fluid and experimental, which is something I've put down to my Caribbean roots. I spoke to my auntie Gina about her first-hand accounts and memories of dressing styles in the Caribbean. I arrived here at Southampton on the 2nd of September 1960. came from St. Kitts. I was only age eight. Our cousin was a seamstress. She used to make lots of clothes for us. And my granny, she used to do sewing as well, made our clothes. We we came here with the clothes that we had from there, which was not suitable for here, because it was all light, lightweight clothes, and you needed winter clothes, didn't you? Well, they used to still have the same kind of materials that they used to wear, some just bright colours. And they used to... I think they used to go and make them themselves, actually. It's a bright coloured skirts and dresses with all patterns on flowers, which wasn't really here, because mainly then, in 1960, they wasn't wearing those bright colours. So they stood out. So with all of this in mind, I set myself the challenge to create a collection of fabrics that were bright and vibrant. Although here I am setting up a completely plain warp, this was giving me the foundation to be able to create something very unique and different with every single sample. I used warp painting as my method of applying colour and pattern. The approach was very fluid and it allowed me to create different designs for different fabrics. Developing this further and using different types of fabric paints, I began to create a look for this collection. 
I used West Indian Sea Island cotton, which I had previously dyed from another project. And here I am setting up the bobbins to weave with the yarn. Once the fabric was woven, I then thought to how I could use this in a fashion space. One of the ways I wanted to use my fabric was as a backdrop to bring a Caribbean-esque feeling to the shoot. I also wanted to make a garment or an accessory that I could pair alongside some of my grandfather's work. So here I am making a bucket hat. I found that hats were quite a prominent accessory with Caribbean dressing styles, no matter which decade. So this really felt like it belonged in the shoot. As mentioned before, it was really important for me to bring my heritage story through into my work for this project. My grandfather, William Edmude, was a tailor by trade, and I wanted to pay homage to his work through this project. To better understand my granddad's work, I spoke to family members to learn a bit more about his story. He took up the trade young in Sankey's. I uh, believe it was in Tabernacle, that's where he was born. And he learned his trade from a man called um, Mr. Allington. I always remember him talking about Mr. Allington, learning him how to, how to tailor, how to do. He didn't do patterns, as you know, he just learned it by measuring, chalking, everything else. But yeah, it was um, a Mr. Allington that learned him how to, um, how to tailor. If your dad or your uncles needed trousers, he did those. Um, trousers for school, I had my skirts for school, my blouses, everything. He just did it as passion. So it wasn't a professional, but he continued doing that, yeah. I remember, we've still got the sewing machine. Okay. Um, and I remember the sewing machine always used to be in the corner of the dining room of by the window. Um, and the noise it used to make, it, was, it, was, it wasn't an electronic one, so it was a pedal, so you just had to pedal it. And um, I always just remember I used to sit on the arm of the sofa watching him sew, and he could just have a piece of fabric, which used to get from the market, have some fabric, mark a pair of trousers in no time, measure up, mark it up, cut it up, and in no time, you know, you've got you've got a pair of trousers or you've got a skirt or, you know, if he was doing a suit, it would take a little bit longer. Um, but I always remember he was so, is the word meticulous, when it came to ironing and steaming the trousers, it had to be straight. You couldn't be messing around and trying to do it double seam, no. Everything just had to be correct. I chose to style my final shoe, featuring my fabrics as part of the backdrop, as well as pairing some of my granddad's outfits that my dad had still kept with my hats. Here you can see my model sharing some of the looks. My grandfather's story is not unique. Many Caribbean people would have come to this country with a particular trade, but were not able to continue that trade and took up work that was available for them at the time. Although my grandfather did go to college whilst he was here in England, he learned the trade back home in St. Kitts, and his work was never elevated to the level where it could be appreciated by many more.
The way in which I used my textiles in this fashion piece definitely relates to the experience of flight and migration. Textile and fashion designers in a similar background to my own can most definitely move forward and further decolonize the spaces that we work in by incorporating the threads of our identity through our work. By incorporating West Indian Sea Island cotton in my work, I believe I've brought the threads of identity, the threads of migration, and a greater story into the fashion world that may not have been seen before. As mentioned in the beginning, this project is an ongoing body of work, and so I intend to develop this work further and see where my ideas will take me. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you to Ellie for allowing me to have the space to share my work and research.